But it still is apparently not second nature to people to hold politicians to account for things they've actually said before you let them go off and start flogging the next um, gallon of snake oil. James O'Brien. Hello, mate. Hi. You have become a torchbearer, a weather vane for a large part of this country. Where do you draw your confidence from? Weirdly, I think almost by accident, they put out clips of me talking into the ether, usually not even talking to callers in the first instance. It was these, these you call them monologues or rants, depending on whether you like me or not. Um, and they just went nuts. That element about your broadcasting, that element about your politics and your approach, what I'm trying to ascertain is whether you think that's how effective that is at changing people's minds? How effective is that at getting someone to change their position on something? I've changed a lot over the years from when I first started doing it. I was a lot more declamatory, even in the last couple of years. What I do now, and the stuff that tends to go nuts on the internet, is the stuff that you lead people out, which is, I think, what literally what educate means in, in Latin, to be pompous for a moment. You, you, you ask people why they think what they think. Five years ago, ten years ago, I was doing what everybody else did, which was tell you what I think and then ask you what you think, and sometimes never the twain shall meet, which is, I think, part of the reason why we're in such a mess now, because that has become the accepted model, and doing a manufactured, confected debate on television or radio has become a replacement for having current affairs broadcasting that tells you what you need to know, not that says, you know, climate change, MMR, Brexit, Trump, here are two sides. There aren't two sides on those four issues, there is the right side, and then there's everybody else. And, and everybody else needs help coming over to the right side, and the last thing that is going to help them is treating them as if their position is valid as everybody else's. We'll talk about being on the right side then, because I think the criticism that some people would throw at you... What? What criticism? Is that, I think people would say they feel that you're a bit smug. Yeah. And how much then is calling your book That's How to Be Right, right about provo right. Yeah, provoking that? Or does it lend any credence to what they have to say? I don't know. I mean, it, 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 you, you can't be smug if you look like a wazzock. You, you can't be smug if you keep losing arguments. You can't be smug. You'd need to invent a different word. I don't know what it would be. But if, if, if you agree with the person I'm arguing with and they end up looking stupid, I, I completely understand why you would call me smug. Um, but it's just a euphemism for right. So how to be right was better than how to be smug. How much do you think, do you feel at all, it's been impotent or ineffective in recent times? It's been worse than impotent. It's been actively poisoning the public discourse. I, I think from, I mean, it's hard to pick a place that isn't, but in, in particular, you'd have to look at Paul Dacre's editorship of the Daily Mail, coupled with stuff I was a little late to the party on, actually. I, I thought all of the um, content creatives in the internet sphere were all top, top, top people like Joe. I didn't know about Infowars and I didn't know about Breitbart and occasionally they'd pop up on my radar but they were so vile and so obviously uh, unpleasant that, that I'd turn my radar off and then suddenly you've got Donald Trump claiming that the Washington Post is fake news and Alex Jones is a trustworthy news source and, and he's in the White House and you realise, oh shit, this has gone far too far already. But in Britain, uh, it, it, you just look at the Daily Mail and what the Daily Telegraph has become, what the Daily Express became under Richard Desmond, what the Sun has been forever, but uh, it, except for that brief window under David Yellen, but which it has doubled down on under Tony Gallagher, and, and it's, it's, it's utterly repellent, and it, we're so used to it. And I would start it off in newspapers. If I'd stayed in newspapers, I wouldn't say this stuff. I wouldn't see this stuff. I've got friends, people I love, who still work on titles I've just mentioned, and we tend not to talk about it at all because I would be paying my bills. I only ever wanted to be a journalist and if that was the only opportunity I'd got, I'd be doing, I wouldn't be doing columns saying things I didn't believe, but I'd be writing about theatre or, or politics in a newspaper where the comment writers were writing stuff that I found repellent and I'd have to persuade myself I didn't find it repellent. So for, for me, Murdoch, Kelvin McKenzie, Paul Dacre, um, are, are responsible for turning Britain into an international laughing stock, and the process isn't over yet. Is it it's worse with Dacre because he went after the independence of the judiciary with that um, enemies of the people headline. He went after uh, parliamentary sovereignty with that crush the saboteurs front page. He went after um, 
academic independence, academic freedom with the our Remainer universe, those three front pages, for me, triangulated fears and suspicions I'd had for a long time. And when I wrote the original <coughs> conclusion to the book, I wrote the first thing we have to do is get Paul Dacre out of the editor's chair at the Daily Mail and get Alex Jones off social media. And about a week before it was going to the printers, both of those things happened. So that was the first taste of trying to write a book about current affairs when affairs are a tiny bit too current. And it's, it's been no different with the paperback release, which I've done a, an updated chapter for, which will be out of date by the time we finish this interview. Is it not a bit of a cop-out, though? Go on. You know, to say that the media are complicit in whatever They're it is that complicit. you dislike or, no, you know... But it, when, when what's, it's not about what I dislike. It's about speaking to people on page after page after page in that book who've been persuaded of things that aren't true. Mm -hmm. So I dislike deception, but that, that's not controversial or smug. And it's not a cop-out. They've been lied to. They've been told that immigrants are stealing their jobs when they're not. They've been told that immigrants, Schrodinger's immigrant, is simultaneously stealing your job and coming over here to claim all your benefits, which is not true. You find one example of it that does not extrapolate into six million people doing it. They've been told that political correctness has gone mad without knowing what is meant by the phrase political correctness or why having political correctness would in any way be a bad thing. They've been given clubs with which to sort of hit people over the head or to hit themselves over the head usually. And that's not a question of me not liking what they're saying. That's a question of demonstrable untruth being mainstreamed by the most powerful people in the British media, almost exclusively bankrolled by non-domicile, tax-avoiding billionaires who claim to be patriotic. So, so no, I don't accept that criticism. I'm just, say I'm just saying, I think it might... It's a, it's a tale as old as time, isn't it? You yes. know, and it's a trick now pulled off by Corbyn, Farage, Trump, you know, Blaming the media is almost a, a, a tactic now. Yes, like. yes, it is. And, and, but it doesn't mean that everybody who does it is wrong. You know, J Jeremy Corbyn blames the media because the alternative would be to talk to them. And Seamus Milne doesn't want him to for reasons that are pretty obvious to anybody who's ever seen Jeremy Corbyn being interviewed. Donald Trump blames the media because he's trying to normalise corruption. So if he can get fake news up and running, and then his own, when evidence of his own corruption emerges, he can do that false equivalence thing. And, you know, how many members of his campaign team are in prison now? But his base still thinks that Hillary Clinton did something wrong with her emails that they don't understand or particularly care about. But Trump's managed to create that false equivalence by doing the fake news stuff. Lies that are told and attempts to undermine fundamental principles of our democracy like academic freedom, um, parliamentary sovereignty and, and an independent judiciary, that, that is a different beast entirely. But what they've done cleverly, more so Trump and Farage than Corbyn, what they've done very cleverly is kind of turn I know you are but what am I into a political ideology. So, so every time you criticise them for doing something, they say, I know you are, but what am I? So someone somewhere today, after Farage was turned over last night on Channel 4 News for having some mansion in Chelsea that's been paid for by, uh, uh, reportedly, allegedly paid for by Aaron Banks, somebody somewhere on social media, one of the Brexit party supporting halfwits, will be saying, well, why haven't you looked at Vince Cable's rent? Or why haven't you looked at Change UK? They just ignore the, the because it gives them a, an escape route. And the media have done that. They've built the escape route. Let's look at that now then. So reports this week that Nigel Farage received a significant donation from businessman Aaron Banks, yeah. nearly half a million quid. In any other time, yeah. that would be the end of someone's political career, would it not? I think so. I got a tweet from, I think, someone on the Times saying, no, it wouldn't. Um, but again, she, she was saying, I don't blame American media for Trump. And I thought, I kind of do, actually. But I think it would have been. I think, I think a British politician, he's not legally obliged to disclose all of this stuff because the MEP's rules are different. It's only seven years, I think, or six years since Nigel Farage pledged to publicly have his European Parliament expenditure independently audited, so I'm sure that's going to happen any minute now. But, but yeah, I think you're right, and that's why, that's why I think um, that you can't pin that on anyone except the media. Who, who else would have led the calls? for standards in public life to be upheld, if not the media, you know, they're not going to do it voluntarily. 450, 13 grand a month for a mansion in Chelsea while he's punting around the country claiming to represent the interests of ordinary working people, almost all of whom under any Brexit analysis are going to be economically damaged by a no deal. And 13 grand a month for a mansion in Chelsea. It's not going to touch him in the polls. And it's gone too far. We're down the rabbit hole now. And that has to be the media's fault because who else is the bridge between the politic, the body politic, the polit political world and, the, and the, the politician and the punter? It's us. But we've blown it. 
absolutely blown it. We'll, we'll come to that no deal side of things in a minute, but I'd like to talk about the Brexit party for a moment. Mm. If you could call it that, maybe perhaps a group. And the reason I say that is because at the moment there's no discernible policy beyond that no deal and there isn't a manifesto. No. Does that just make it amount to a cult of personality around? Of course it is, and he knows that. And I think I'm just surprised by some of the people that are helping him. But the, when you look into uh, Spiked, is it? And, and the former members of the Revolutionary Communist Party. I, I mean, there's some interesting questions to be asked there. But yeah, and look at what the cult of personality is. Since this Brexit party launched, he's claimed that he founded it, which he didn't. He's claimed that he was saying no deal is better than no Brexit before the referendum, which he wasn't. Again, back to the media, how is he allowed to lie like this? Un unchallenged answer, well, we don't. He said after the Andrew Marr interview, I won't come back again. And that, that is, if you had to nutshell everything, the fear that they won't come back, these people that deliver click, clicks and, and popularity, the fear that they won't come back is why they don't get properly held to account. So he didn't found it. He didn't say no deal is better than a bad deal before the referendum result. He's got no members. He's only got supporters. Um, there's no evidence of where the money has come from. There's no evidence that he has been funded in the way that he claims it's been funded. We know that some businessmen have been giving large donations to the party. We now know reportedly that Aaron Banks has been paying his rent on a 13 grand a month mansion in Chelsea and a five grand a month bodyguard stroke chauffeur. We know that the two people who had to step down as treasurer and chairman because they were found to have posted precisely the sort of vile social media, Islamophobia and racism as his old mates in UKIP are still on the board. Um, we know that it's not a political party in any sense. He won't answer questions about where the money comes from. He won't answer questions about things he's said in the past. He won't answer questions about policies because there aren't, aren't, aren't any. All he does is complain about a, a narrative of betrayal and victimhood. And if that's not a cult of personality, then I'm, I'm a banana. How did we end up here then? How did we end up with that no deal Brexit being advocated? If he never said it before, how has he managed to get to a position where he can say it now? Because Theresa May employed the phrase that had become the, the bleat of the, of, the, of the Brexit betrayal narrative. In July 2016, I wrote on Twitter, Farage will be back, not as quickly as last time, because the, he has to distance him, himself from the reality of Brexit before he can come back bleating about betrayal. That was, that was within a month of the referendum result. I knew it. It's not particularly clairvoyant of me, but people are still surprised by it. It, 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 it's come to this because nobody ever thought that it would reach into proper politics. UKIP were always a bit funny. The European Parliament, whether you were pro-European, well, we're all European, whether or not you, none, none of us took it seriously enough. None of us knew how much we owed to, to those relationships. And that's why no one ever thought that this mainstreaming of, oh, it doesn't matter, we'll put someone else on the panel who's telling the truth. They'll balance each other, everyone. And then, of course, you begin to realise there are people in the upper echelons of the British media who actually agree with that um, world view and actually are xenophobic and are unpleasant and are dreaming of a return to sort of Victorian-style values, which won't hit all the people that the voters think it will hit, like the Muslims and the immigrants and the feckless Workshire layabouts. It will hit them. That's how, that's how all things. Is there anyone you think highly of in British politics? Lots of people. I, I mean, the problem with Brexit is it's the lens through which we now look at everything. So I, I probably if I do it off the top of my head, everyone I'm going to mention is, is probably going to lean towards Remain. But a lot of them will have voted for the withdrawal agreement on the grounds that that does deliver at least what the referendum promised to deliver. I like people who prioritise national interest over personal interest. So anyone at the moment, whether it's the Change UK lot, who have really not played a great hand, but they have probably jeopardised their own careers in order to do what they thought was right. Nick Bowles, I thought that was a, a, an amazing moment when he, live in the house, walked away. Um, I think David Lammy is a very special politician. Uh, it was when I did Unfiltered with him, actually, that, that I saw a passion. Politicians, when they're talking about themselves, are normally a hell of a lot more animated than they are when they're talking about principles and policies. Lammy, in my experience, is the opposite. Lammy came alive when he was talking about the stuff that he cares about and was a little bit impatient and bored when we were talking about him. Uh, Ken Clark, I had the pleasure of interviewing at length quite recently for my Full Disclosure podcast, and, and he was... He was a legend. Um, there's plenty of people I like, but what I've realised in the last few years is that the politicians who are doing the best job are probably the ones whose names we don't know. 
because they're not on speed dial for Andrew Marr or, or, or LBC or BBC Breakfast. They're, they're not in it to get their faces on telly. You see a pudding like Marc Francois getting interviewed absolutely everywhere, every single day, and you realise that for every Marc Francois, please God, there are 10 MPs who are busy doing constituency work and not wanging on about his, his, his Second World War revivalism wet dream. Is there anyone then in the Conservative Party leadership picture after Theresa May that doesn't fit those criteria? Yeah, the, the woman I just compared to Adolf Hitler. <laughs> and that's not a joke. I mean, I, th I think it was... Uh, I like. I, if you had to pick someone, I quite like the cut of Amber Rudd's jib. The problem is they're all now hostage to this no-deal nonsense, to this no-deal lie, all of them. Even... I mean, Gove and Johnson went through different lobbies on the withdrawal agreement. The two chairmen of Vote Leave went through different lobbies and yet they're still claiming that there's some sort of homogenous representation of 17.4 million people and you can see Hunt has already moved on it, Truss has already, it's despicable to see actually, utterly, utterly despicable to see people who know that it is going to do immeasurable harm to the national interest and the economy but they also know that there's no way they can lead the Conservative Party unless in the current climate they publicly state that no deal would be better than remaining, and, and I, I, I mean, you think things are bad, mate, they're about to get a hell of a lot worse. You think that's the argument then for a second referendum? Yeah, it has to be, although uh, Philip Cowley in the Times today was, um, no, Philip Collins, was it Cowley or Collins? Someone called Philip in the Times today was very persuasive on the argument of why that would actually, if you called off Brexit, you, you, it could make things worse. Not, not, I don't think, the threats of picking up rifles and I mean, this sort of Civil march, piece of the nation. Yeah, the march of the, of the Zimmer-framed hooligan. I don't think that's going to happen. But um, it could damage democracy in a way. If it happened after a second referendum, it would be mitigated hugely. I, I've even flirted lately with the idea, just do it and let them see. But, of course, that is inflicting avoidable damage upon the nation's most vulnerable people. And I don't understand why anybody goes into politics, whatever they're party or ideology might be, if not to protect the people most in need of protection. Unfortunately, the politicians riding high in the public perception at the moment are the ones who are, in my view, the ones who are actually going to make, who, who believe in making people's lives worse. They believe in deregulation. They believe in removing health and safety. They believe in getting rid of collective bargaining power provided by trade union membership. They really do believe that if bosses are free to do whatever they want, then their world will improve. And, and you don't have to go back very far in British history to see why they believe that. You know, Look at Downton Abbey and think of a world in which what, eight, five, six people lived a life of untrammeled luxury while a hundred people toiled below stairs to provide it. People look back on that nostalgically. And the bit I don't get is why the 21st century voter who would be thanking his lucky stars to have got a gig as second underfootman thinks that returning to the days of a Rhys Moggian, forelock togging, cap doffing, um, aristocratic model is going to be good for him. That's the bit I don't get. And that's the bit that scares me the most, the deference that is abroad at the moment. This idea that, oh, we'll trust him because he's posh. Johnson, rees Farage, all slightly fake in their poshness. No one talks like Jacob rees well, I've got a lot of mates that went to Eton. I went to bloody Ampleforth. Nobody talks like that unless they've sat at home pretending to. Listen to his sister. Leave his sister. Prince William sounds like Grant Mitchell next to Jacob rees -Mogg. It's a conscious decision. It's a, it's a Lord Snooty pantomime performance. But it works. People think, well, he's incredibly posh. We must trust him. David Cameron's book's out in September. Is it? Yeah. Like, were you going to read it? I feel compelled it's to. It's going to be hard not to, isn't it? But why? I mean, what, what? <sighs> you don't hear his side of it, do you? His side of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Flipping a ham-faced goon. I, I, honestly, I did, out of all of them, all of them, he's probably the one I... Really? Yeah. Because I know what... In that they, list of Johnson, yeah, Rees, Mogg, yeah, Farage. I know what they are. I know what they are. It's why their fans hate me so much, especially Farage's. I know what he is. He knows that I know what he is. That's the thing they can't forgive. I hold up mirrors. That's my job on the radio. I, and, and if they hate what they see in the mirror, it's not my fault. Cameron, don't quite get it. Don't quite get it. Two stories probably get to the heart of him. Why, why do you want to be Prime Minister? I think I'll be good at it. And someone told me very recently, I can't tell you who, that they met him when he'd been in the job for about a year. And they said, how are you getting on? How are you finding it? He goes, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. So to see the Premiership solely through 
or from the perspective of your own relationship with it. Not to mention at any point I can do good, I can help, I can improve. Just to look at all the career options that are open to you as a, as a quasi-aristocratic, old Etonian, conservative, leaving Oxford. Mother-in-law got him a gig at Carlton Communications working for Michael Green. But he obviously had his, he thought, I, I, befitting of my status. That's why he wanted to be Prime Minister. That's why the country is in the toilet. What gives you hope, James O'Brien? Young people, which is not patronising, or um, I hope, uh, or even paternalistic. But you look at the breakdown in the numbers. Look at climate change. Look at Greater Thunberg. Look at the way that the, the Brexit party, as you mentioned earlier, their support is almost, almost entirely confined to, to people above 60 and older, most of whom, for what it's worth, are actually people in the southeast who've paid off their mortgages. This narrative about working class northern voters is as patronising as it is ridiculous, as MPs like Anna Turley point out brilliantly, and as the council elections recently proved. But, and history gives me hope. I interviewed Ian Hislop recently, and I asked him why he, because he had his private eye. I mean, you know, um, he should be even more dismayed and depressed about politics than I am. But he just said, as a classicist and as a historian, I've seen it all before. That doesn't comfort me as much as it comforts him, because I, I don't want to go through it again. I, I, I kind of go for that. Those who don't learn from history are condemned forever to repeat it. But, but, but it can't carry on. It, even if it's just the pendulum theory of politics, it will get here, it might go further, and then it will swing back again. And for about... I don't know, 13 minutes in 2037, everything might be all right for a while and then we'll start swinging in that direction. What better place to leave it? Thank you, mate. Cheers, Ollie. Cheers. Thank you.